ओम नमो भगवते श्री रमनाया थैंक यू वाह योर सत्संग ग्रुप दिस इज मोरली फ्रॉम द मिशिगन सत्संग ग्रुप टुडे वी विल स्टार्ट विद द रीडिंग फ्रॉम द बुक वर्ड्स ऑफ ग्रेस चैप्टर टू सेल्फ इंक्वायरी बाय शार्मी मेहता एंड शमा मेहता दिस विल बी फॉलोड बाय अ सॉन्ग अरुणय मलयल बाय कल्पना एंड अ रीडिंग ऑन भगवान फ्रेंड रंगन फ्रॉम रमण पेरिय पुराणम बाय श्री वी गणेशन self inquiry chapter 1 who am i is not the sense of i natural to all beings expressed in all their feelings as i came i went i did or i was on questioning what this is we find that the body is identified with i because movements and similar functions pertain to the body can the body then be this i consciousness it was not there before birth it is composed of the five elements it is absent in sleep and it eventually becomes a corpse no it cannot be the sense of i which arises in the body for the time being is otherwise called the ego ignorance illusion impurity or individual self the purpose of all the scriptures in this inquiry into the self it is declared in them that the annihilation of the ego sense is liberation how then can one remain indifferent to this teaching can the body which is insentient as a piece of wood shine and function as i no therefore lay aside this insentient body as though it were truly a corpse do not even murmur i but inquire keenly within what it is that now shines within the heart as i underlying the unceasing flow of varied thoughts there arises the continuous unbroken awareness silent and spontaneous as i i in the heart if one catches hold of it and remains still it will completely annihilate the sense of i in the body and will itself disappear as a fire of burning camphor sages and scriptures proclaim this to be liberation the veil of ignorance can never completely hide the self how can it even the ignorant do not feel the speak of the i it only hides the reality i am the self or i am pure consciousness and confounds the i with the body the self is self effluent one need give it no mental picture anyway the thought that imagines it is itself bondage because the self is the effulgence transcending darkness and light one should not think of it with the mind such imagination will end in bondage whereas the self spontaneously shines as the absolute this inquiry into the self in devotional meditation evolves into the state of absorption of the mind into the self and leads to liberation and unqualified bliss the great sages have declared that only by the help of this devotional inquiry into the self can liberation be attained because the ego in the form of the i thought is the root of the tree of illusion its destruction fells illusion even as a tree is felled by the cutting of its roots this easy method of annihilating the ego is alone worthy to be called bhakti devotion jnana knowledge yoga union or dhyana meditation in the i am the body consciousness the three bodies composed of the five sheets are contained if that mode of consciousness is removed all else drops off of its own accord all other bodies depend on it there is no need to eliminate them separately because the scriptures declare that thought alone is bondage it is their final injunction that the best method is to surrender the mind in the form of the i thought to him the self and keeping quite still not forget him
Chapter 2 The Mind According to the Hindu scriptures, an entity known as the mind is derived from the subtle essence of the food consumed, which flourishes as love, hatred, lust, anger, and so on, which is the totality of mentality, intellect, desire, and ego, which although it has such diverse functions, bears the generic name mind, which is objectified as the insentient objects cognized by us, which though itself insentient, appears to be sentient, being associated with consciousness, just as a piece of red hot iron appears to be fire, in which the principle of differentiation is inherent, which is transient and is possessed of parts capable of being molded into any shape like lac, gold, or wax, which is the basis of all root principles, tattvas, which is located in the heart, like sight in the eye and hearing in the ear, which gives its character to the individual self, in which on thinking of the object already associated with the consciousness reflected on the brain, assumes a thought form which is in contact with that object through the five senses operated by the brain, which appropriates such cognizance to itself with the feeling I am cognizant of such and such, enjoys the object and is finally satisfied. To think whether a certain thing may be eaten is a thought form of the mind. It is good. It is not good. It can be eaten. It cannot be eaten. Discriminating notions like these constitute the discriminative intellect because the mind alone constitutes the root principle manifesting as the three entities of ego, God, and world. Its absorption and dissolution in the self is the final emancipation known as Kaivalya, which is the same as Brahman. The senses being located externally as aids for the cognition of objects are exterior. The mind being internal is the inner sense within and without are relative to the body. They have no significance in the absolute. For the purpose of showing the whole objective world to be within and not without, the scriptures have described the cosmos as being shaped like the lotus of the heart. But that is not other than the self. Just as the goldsmith's wax ball, although hiding minute specks of gold, still looks like a simple lump of wax, so too all the individuals merged in dark ignorance of vidya or the universal veiling maya are only aware of the nations in their sleep in deep sleep the physical and subtle bodies though entering in the dark veiling still lie merged in the self from ignorance sprang the ego the subtle body the mind must be transformed into the self Mind is in reality only consciousness because it is pure and transparent by nature. In that pure state, however, it cannot be called mind. The wrong identification of one thing with another is the work of the contaminated mind. That is to say, the pure uncontaminated mind being absolute consciousness on becoming oblivious of its primary nature is overpowered by the quality of darkness, tamas, and manifests as the physical world. Similarly, overpowered by activity, rajas, it identifies itself with the body and appearing in the manifested world as I, mistakes this ego for the reality. Thus, swayed by love and hatred, it performs good and bad actions and as a result, caught up in the cycle of births and rebirths and deaths. It is the experience of everyone that in deep sleep and in a faint, he has no awareness of his own self or of objectivity. Later, the experience I woke up from sleep, I regained consciousness, is the distinctive knowledge born of the natural state. This distinctive knowledge is called Vijnana. It shines not by itself, but by always adhering either to the self or the non-self. When it in he inheres in the self, it is called true knowledge. It is awareness of the mental mode in the self, or perpetual awareness, and when this distinctive knowledge 
combines with the non-self, it is called ignorance. The state in which it inheres in the self and shines as the self is termed aham spurana, or the pulsation of the self. This is not something apart from the self. It is a sign of the forthcoming realization of the self. However, this is not the state of primal being. The source in which this pulsation is revealed is called prajnana, consciousness. It is this source that Vedanta proclaims as prajnana ghana. The Vivek Chudamani of Shankaracharya describes this eternal state as follows. In the sheath of intelligence shines eternally Atman, the self-effulgent witness of all, making that thy goal, which is quite different from the unreal, enjoyed by experience through unbroken thought current as thy own self. The ever-luminous self is one and universal, notwithstanding the individual's experience of the three states, waking, dream, and deep sleep, the self remains pure and changeless. It is not limited by the three bodies, physical, mental, and causal, and it transcends the triple relation of seer, sight, and seen. The illustration of how the luminous consciousness of the self, shining by itself, functions as the causal body, seven, in the inner chamber surrounded by walls of ignorance of vidya and led by the door of sleep which is moved by the vital forces due to the lapse of time and according to destiny through the doorway against the interposed mirror of the ego it passes with the light reflected therefrom into the middle chamber of the dream state later is projected into the open courtyard of wakefulness through the passage of the five senses or windows when the door of sleep is shut by the force of the mind that is the vital forces due to the lapse of time and according to destiny it retires from the wakeful and dream states into deep sleep and remains merely as itself without the ego sense Thus, it also illustrates the serene existence of the self as different from the ego and from the three states of sleep dream and wakefulness the individual self resides in the eye during the waking state, in the neck during the dream state, and in the heart during deep sleep. But the heart is the chief among these places, and therefore the individual self never entirely leaves the heart. Although it is specifically said that the neck is the seat of the mind, the brain of the intellect, and the heart or the whole body of the ego, Still the scriptures state conclusively that the heart is the seat of that totality of the inner senses, which is called the mind. The sages, having investigated all the different versions of the scriptures, briefly stated that the whole truth, that it is the experience of everyone, that the heart is primarily the seat of the eye. Thank 
நிலையிலும் முன்னை நினைக்க இரக்கம் காட்டி அருள்வாயா விழித்த நிலையிலும் முறக்க நிலை போல் உணர்வில் இருக்க செய்வாயா உறக்க நிலையிலும் முன்னை நினைக்க இரக்கம் காட்டி அருள்வாயா பிடித்த நிலையிலும் முறக்க நிலை போல் உணர்வில் இருக்க செய்வாயா வேண்டும் பொருள் எது தெரிய நிலையில் வேண்டி வேண்டும் பொருள் எது தெரிய நிலையில் வேண்டி நின்றேன் உன்னிடத்தில் தேவை எனக்கு அது தெரிந்த நீயே தேவை எனக்கு அது தெரிந்த அருணை மலையில் அமர்ந்த குருவே கருணை வடிவில் வாழ்ந்த கருவே என்னை அறிய அருணை மலையில் அமர்ந்த குருவே மனதில் கடந்து அருளை உணர்ந்தாய் பிறவி அதுக்கு உன்னில் அடங்கும் விழியின் பொழியில் உனது மடியில் கலந்து இருப்பேன் காலின் அடியில் மனதில் கடந்து அருளை உணர்ந்தாய் பிறவி அதுக்கு உன்னில் அடங்கும் விழியின் பொழியில் உனது மடியில் கலந்து இருப்பேன் காலின் அடியில் எண்ணம் கரைக்க என்னை மறக்க ரமணா எண்ணம் கரைக்க என் எண்ணம் கரைக்க என்னை மறக்க ரமணா எண்ணம் கரைக்க என்னை மறக்க மௌன மொழிய சொல்வாகையா அருணை மலையில் அமர்ந்த குருவே கருணை வடிவில் வாழ்ந்த கருவே என்னை அறிய
ಎಲ್ಲ ಮಂದ friend Rangan. Rangaiyar, also known as Rangan, lived in Tiruchuri, Bhagavan's birthplace. He was Bhagavan's classmate and childhood friend. Bhagavan's family and Rangan's family moved to Madurai around the same time and the two boys continued to be close friends until Bhagavan ran away to Arunachala. It was 1903 when Rangan first came to know about Bhagavan's whereabouts in Arunachala. However, being tied down by family responsibilities, he could not come and see him immediately. After a few years, when Bhagavan was at Virupaksha cave, he finally paid him a visit. Sri Bhagavan greeted Rangan with an affectionate gesture of friendship, a punch to his shoulder. At first, Rangan could only view Bhagavan as his friend Venkataraman. He demanded, Hey Venkataraman, even the evening before you left Madurai, we were playing football. I am supposed to be your closest friend. Why did you not tell me that you were going away the next day? Bhagavan replied, Ranga, did I travel like a normal traveller with baggage and all that? It was a supreme force which drew me that day to Arunachala. Where was their room for any formalities to be observed? Bhagavan looked steadily at him and immediately Rangan could see that he was no more just Venkataraman, his friend, his classmate, the football player or his mate in the swimming pool. Ranga could see this change in Bhagavan. The master had by now become somewhat legendary and a few devotees had already gathered there. Yet when Rangan came to Virupaksha cave, Bhagavan treated him with the same love. Their relationship was beautiful. It was that of a fully awakened man, a sage of wisdom and an ignorant man steeped in family sufferings, not spiritually inclined but with a deep love for Bhagavan. The master appreciated the depth of that friendship and would sit next to his friend by his bedside. Seeing him tossing and turning, weighed down by his problems, Bhagavan would pat him and ask gently, Hey Ranga, what is bothering you? One day, Rangan told him about his troubles. Have you given enough to your family to live on while you have come away here? Bhagavan inquired. Rangan was silent, too embarrassed to admit his inability to provide for his family. So, you have some financial problems, Bhagavan surmised. Is it enough if you get 10,000 rupees? This was a huge amount in those days and it surprised Rangan to hear Bhagavan talking about money. Bhagavan pressed on, Will it solve all your problems if you get 10,000 rupees? Rangan remained quiet and after a few days took leave of Bhagavan and went to Chennai. He managed to get a sales job selling trucks and buses. When he got his commission, it was exactly 10,000 rupees. Once when Rangan was going around the hill along with Bhagavan, he stepped on a thorn. Bhagavan bent over and removed the thorn himself. Rangan had not noticed Bhagavan's feet until then. But after walking for a little while, he saw Bhagavan stepping on a thorn. He cried, Bhagavan, Bhagavan, there is a thorn in your foot. Please sit down, let me remove it. Bhagavan sat down to oblige his friend. However, when Rangan took a look at Bhagavan's foot, he saw not one, but innumerable thorns. Bhagavan wryly remarked, Ranga, which thorns are you going to remove? The old ones or the new ones? Let it go. Bhagavan, how can you walk? Rangan protested. Bhagavan calmly gestured. See, when a thorn goes into the foot, just rub it on the earth 
and everything will be all right. Rangan once had the opportunity to physically embrace Bhagavan. He was again amazed that the master's skin was silky and soft as a lotus petal. When he had known him in Madurai, his skin had been very rough, so much so that if he rubbed against somebody else, it would hurt. He asked Bhagavan in wonderment, Bhagavan, how come the texture of your skin has changed? Bhagavan responded with the same reply, Spiritual perfection changes everything. Another time, as a friend, he took the liberty to ask the Guru, Bhagavan, why does your head shake all the time and why do you need a walking stick? Bhagavan confided in his friend, Ranga, this is not because of old age. When I came to Trivannamalai, after the death experience, and took shelter at the foot of Arunachala, this head shot started shaking. Why? Rangan inquired, looking puzzled. Bhagavan replied, Can you imagine a violent, wild, mad elephant entering a small thatched shed? What would happen to the hut is what has happened to this body. It will go to pieces. This is how the immensity of Bhagavan's spiritual experience had affected his body. Once Rangan asked, Bhagavan, you attained enlightenment while you were still in Madurai, isn't it? Bhagavan replied, when I was studying, Arunachala entered me most powerfully, though apparently I was unaware. It is his grace that he revealed himself to me. I felt like my whole body was burning. From that moment on, I was in Samadhi. Though I continued to play and talk with you, I was in Samadhi all the while. Bhagavan revealed this only to Rangan. Rangan often felt that he could not stand up to the demands of spiritual practice because he was entangled in his worries about his family money and other worldly problems. Bhagavan would tell him, throw your thoughts out. You will enjoy freedom only in a state where there are no thoughts. Unfortunately, Rangan found it difficult to follow this counsel. Feeling that it was impossible for him to progress spiritually, he asked, how many times will I be born again before I get jnana? Bhagavan gave a beautiful answer. In reality, there are no factors like time and distance. In one hour, we dream that many days and years have passed by. In a movie, don't you see mere shadows being transformed into vast seas, mountains and buildings? The world is not outside you. All happens within you like in the movie show. The small world that is in the mind appears as the big world outside. Rangan complained later, Bhagavan, your grace is not on me. Bhagavan smiled graciously and replied, Ranga, you are speaking like one who is standing neck deep in the floodwaters of the Ganges, complaining that he is thirsty and says, that he wants water from the tap of his house to be bought to quench his thirst. After coming to the present Ramanashramam, Rangan saw many imperfections in the residence there. Remarking on this, he said, How is it, Bhagavan, that your devotees have growing egos even though they are living around you? Bhagavan replied, How else can the ego be destroyed? It has to come out of the individual. Therefore, this is only a cleansing process, not a growing process. Another time, Rangan asked Bhagavan, Why do you always extol the stone-filled hill as God? Bhagavan said, Do you think Arunachala is merely a heap of boulders? Many holy people and yogis live even now in its caves. Arunachala is God, it is Shiva, it is Self, that Self which is your heart. One day, 
when Bhagavan and Rangan were climbing the hill, Rangan told Bhagavan that because he had the good fortune to have Bhagavan's darshan, all his sanchita and agami karma have been burnt away like a bale of cotton caught by a spark of fire and that only his prarabdha karma was left. Bhagavan replied, Even prarabdha will remain only so long as the mind remains. If the mind is destroyed, to whom is prarabdha? Think over that deeply. From that, Rangan understood that once the mind is killed and jnana is attained, there is no such thing as prarabdha. Om Namo Bhagavate Shri Ramanaya. Now we will be handing it over to the Tampa Satsang. Thank you.